Well, good morning. It's great to be with you and to worship with you on this beautiful day that the Lord has given us. If you have a Bible, you can turn them with me to Matthew chapter 22. Today we're going to be looking at verses 41 through 46. So that's Matthew chapter 22, and I will begin reading in verse 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David in the Spirit calls him Lord? Saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we consider this passage of Scripture, we ask for the Spirit's help. We pray that the Spirit of God would give us understanding and that He would cause us to be gripped by the truths that are embedded in this glorious passage. Father, we also ask that You would cause these truths to be embedded in our hearts and minds so that our lives would be more fully yielded to You and that we would live a life worthy of the calling we have received. Father, I pray that as I preach your inspired and inerrant and infallible word, that you would help me to do it for your glory and for the spiritual well-being of these people who have gathered together this morning to hear from heaven. God, we pray that you would make your name great, and we pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven and in our lives as well. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the last six messages that I have preached in the Gospel of Matthew, I have been dealing with the responses of Jesus to the religious authorities of Israel. From Matthew chapter 22, verse 33 and onward, Matthew has been focusing on the challenges that were presented to Jesus by the religious authorities. And we have seen how the religious authorities were continuously conspiring together to do everything they could to undermine the authority of Jesus Christ. The Pharisees have questioned him over the issue of taxes as well as what the greatest commandment is, and the Sadducees have questioned him about the resurrection. But at every turn, none of these ill-devised questions were ever able to stump Jesus in the slightest degree at all. To the contrary, Jesus sufficiently and masterfully answered all their questions. And in so doing, he proved to them that his knowledge is unparalleled. He has shown them that his wisdom is unequaled and cannot be rivaled. And he has been exemplifying for them that he has an authority like no other. And remember, that is the very thing that they were concerned about. If you go back to Matthew chapter 21 in verse 23, notice what it says. In Matthew 21 verse 23, it says, And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Well, in this encounter that Jesus had with the religious authorities, he gave them no answer on this occasion, and he didn't tell them where he got his authority from because he knew that these people only wanted to use it against him to trap him. But interestingly enough, As Jesus continued to respond to the various questions that were posed to him by the religious rulers, 
over the course of time, Jesus was little by little making it unmistakably clear where his authority came from. And the passage that we're looking at today is going to highlight that very truth. This passage at the end of Matthew chapter 22 is where the tables really begin to turn on the religious authorities because no longer are they the ones asking Jesus the questions. Now it's Jesus' turn to put them in the hot seat. And let's just say they didn't last too long. Just look at what it says at the end of this chapter in verse 46. It says, And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. It's amazing to see how the great teachers of the law were so dumbfounded after being asked one question. I mean, they were so confused by it that they couldn't even give him a partial answer. They had no idea how to respond. All they knew is that they better not ask Jesus any more questions. And they were finally beginning to realize that they could not contend with such a man as this. Or at least, that's what they thought him to be. But as we will soon discover, from this passage, we will see that Jesus is far more than a mere man. Because here in this passage, Jesus was teaching the Pharisees that the lofty terms that are used in the Old Testament in reference to the Messiah cannot be used to describe a mere man. You see, Jesus' point in this passage is to show these people that the Old Testament itself envisions the Messiah to be a person of such glory and grandeur that was far beyond what they were expecting him to be. And so let's take a closer look at how Jesus develops his case. It begins with his opening question in verse 42. We start in verse 41. It says, Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? In this question, Jesus cuts to the very heart of the matter, which is the identity of the Messiah. Uh, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Now, understand that when Jesus asked this question, he wasn't asking them who they thought he was. He was simply asking them a general question about what they thought about the Christ, that is, the Messiah. In other words, from your vantage point, who is the Messiah supposed to be? In your estimation, whose son would he be? And that was a very good question for Jesus to ask them. And it was a question that they should have had a robust biblical answer to because this was an issue that was central to Judaism. The coming of the Messiah meant everything to them. And thus knowing what he would do and who he would be was one of the main things that they were concerned about looking into. But how did they do? Did they provide Jesus with a sufficient answer? Well, if you look at their answer in verse 42, you'll notice that they said the Messiah would be the son of David. But was that an adequate answer to Jesus' question? Well, partially, yes, but at the same time, not really. Now, what they said was true, but it was so obviously true, and it was only partially true. I mean, I guess you could say that their answer was, a very mediocre answer. It wasn't all that impressive for the teachers of the law to say that because any Jew in ancient Israel would have been able to say that. Even they would have known to say that. Just think about it this way. It's kind of like when you ask kids a question in Sunday school and no matter what you ask them, their answer is always the same. Jesus, Jesus, right? Like, hey, Jimmy, who wrote the Pentateuch? Jesus Jesus did, right? 
well, is that a sufficient answer? And, you know, you kind of reason with yourself, right? Well, Jesus is one person with two natures. He has a human nature, and he has a divine nature, and in his divine nature, he's God, and God inspired Moses to write the Pentateuch. So, so yeah, Jimmy, you got the question right. <laughs> but it's an okay answer, right? And so it was for the Pharisees. The Pharisees' answer to Jesus' question was just that. It was an okay answer. But for the experts of the law to merely state that the Messiah would be the son of David and say nothing more about his identity is to give a rather simple and somewhat of a shallow answer to a question that demands much more to be said. And so in the following verses, Jesus is going to dig a little deeper and press them on the matter of the Messiah's identity so that they might be challenged to re-examine their thinking regarding who the Christ was truly proclaimed to be. Yes, he would be the son of David to be sure. Of course he would be. But he was also to be far more than the son of David. Look at verses 43 through 45. It says, He said to them, How is it then that David in the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? The question that Jesus posed to the Pharisees here was based upon a passage of Scripture that was spoken about in the Psalms. Jesus was pointing the Pharisees to what David had said uh, way back in Psalm 110. And this was an important place to go and a needful place to go because Psalm 110 is a royal psalm that was believed to be highly messianic. And so based upon Psalm 110, Jesus declared that David, in the Spirit, which by the way shows us that Jesus believed David spoke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But at any rate, the major point that Jesus was seeking to establish is that David called the Messiah Lord. I think it's important for us to briefly visit Psalm 110, especially since it is the most quoted verse in the entire New Testament. So turn your Bibles with me to Psalm 110. I want to read this psalm in its entirety. Psalm 110, verses 1 through 7. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them With corpses, he will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. In the first verse of this psalm, I want you to notice that there are three persons involved. First, there is David, the author and composer of this psalm. Then, there is the Lord, all in capitals, which refers to Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty. But then there is another figure that David refers to as his Lord, which is the Hebrew word Adonai, meaning master. Well, who then is this sovereign master of which David speaks? Well, it's certainly not himself, nor is it his son Solomon, Because the position of authority that this king is given upon his enthronement is far too lofty and heavenly for it to be true of any mere mortal. This future 
king is seated at the right hand of God. For David proclaimed, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Moreover, not only is this Messianic king said to be David's Lord, but in verse 4, we are also told that he is a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. You know, when you just look at the terms that are used to describe this coming Messiah, you can't help but notice how incredibly remarkable of a person this is said to be. I mean, here is a person who not only possesses infinite authority, but a person who also serves as a gracious priest, and not just any priest. This priest is an eternal priest. In other words, his ancestry cannot be traced to any human person such as Aaron or Levi, and yet that does not mean that he is unqualified to serve as priest, because his right to serve in that capacity doesn't come from them anyways. He is a priest of a higher order. It is after the order of Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem. And you can read about him in Genesis chapter 14. My friends, according to this psalm, one of David's descendants would be his Lord, one who would rule and reign from the right hand of God. And yet at the same time, he would also be someone who would eternally bear the office of of a priest, not as someone who inherited that office by right, but as someone who obtained it by divine appointment, as was the case with Melchizedek. You see, the point is that when you really look at what this psalm says about who the Christ would be, to simply say that he would be the son of David just will not do. It will not suffice. Now again, it is true that the Messiah would be the son of David. He would be from the stock of Jesse. Many passages affirm that. But there are other passages such as this one that describes the Messiah in terms that can only be descriptive of a divine figure. And that's what Jesus was telling the Pharisees. He's saying, listen, yes, of course the Messiah would be the son of David, but if that's all he would be, then how can David call him Lord? How can someone who is the Lord of David merely be his descendant? I mean, is it not the case that if the Messiah is truly David's Lord, that it therefore must mean that there is a sense in which he precedes him? Surely it does. And that's what Jesus' point is. Jesus is revealing to the Pharisees that the Messiah is not simply the son of David. He is the son of someone far greater. Indeed, he is the son of God. My friends, Jesus was arguing for the deity of the Christ. He is laboring to show that the Old Testament taught that the Messiah is a divine person who would take on flesh that he would be God himself in human form, that he would be the perfect mediator between God and man because he himself is the God-man, and that through his saving work, God the Father would exalt him and give him a position of authority to rule and reign as the high king of heaven. No wonder the Pharisees were absolutely silenced. They didn't have any comebacks. They couldn't challenge his incredible exegetical insights of Psalm 110. They were simply unable to respond to him, and they came to realize that it wouldn't be wise to do so anyways. Well, over the course of these last two chapters, where we have seen the religious authorities constantly seeking to undermine the authority of Jesus, by the end of it, we see who comes out on top, don't we? Jesus clearly won. The authorities of Israel were outmatched and outplayed at every turn. And by the end of these encounters, it becomes very clear that Jesus possesses an authority like no other. It is unequaled. I mean, every time the religious authorities 
try to put Jesus into a difficult situation, no matter who it was, whether it was the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the lawyers or the Herodians, you name it, no matter who it was that tried to undercut his authority, every time they tried, they failed. And they failed miserably. And unfortunately, they failed to see that the very person who they were talking to was the one whom David had depicted in Psalm 110. Jesus is the Messiah. He is David's Lord. He is the Son of God. He is the creator and sustainer of the universe. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the King of glory. And I'll tell you that the New Testament authors were keen on emphasizing that truth. Time and time again, they were constantly pointing out that Jesus is the prophesied Messiah who fulfills the Davidic covenant because he did, in fact, establish the kingdom of God and was officially installed as king upon his enthronement. I just want to read a few passages for you. We'll look at a couple together. In Luke chapter 1, the angel told Mary this about her son. Speaking of Jesus, it says this in Luke 1, 32 and 33. It says, He will be great, will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, it is true that the angel doesn't specifically identify when Jesus would sit upon the throne of his father David and when he would begin to reign over his kingdom in this text, but thankfully, the other New Testament authors help us out with that. For example, let's go with me to Luke chapter 2, verses 29 through 35. This is an incredible passage. And in this passage, Peter, we know, was preaching his sermon at Pentecost, and in his sermon, he was stressing to the Jews that the one whom they had crucified was the Messiah who is now ruling upon David's throne. Look at Acts 2, 29 through 35. It says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Do you see what Peter is saying here? The Old Testament had made it clear that the Messiah would sit on David's throne and reign as king. And Peter is saying, this is happening right now. It stands to reason then. But David's throne isn't a literal piece of furniture in Jerusalem. It's a heavenly throne that is placed right next to the hand of the Father. Now that might have been contrary to what many Jews were anticipating. And surely it was. But according to Peter... David was anticipating something else. He foresaw the resurrection and the exaltation of the Christ. You see, just as David was the archetypal person that foreshadowed the greater David to come, namely Jesus, so David's throne was the archetypal royal chair that foreshadowed the greater throne to come. Namely, the one that is seated at the right hand of the Father. And that's just the type of thing you would expect. I mean, an eternal king who rules over an eternal kingdom is in need of an eternal throne. And that's where Christ is presently seated. And he will reign 
until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Well, another passage worth highlighting is in the book of 1 Corinthians. You could turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And, you know, honestly, there are scores of passages we could look at. Hebrews chapter 2, Acts chapter 13. There are so many passages in the New Testament that allude to Psalm 110 and help us understand what it's about. But we'll just look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 22 through 26. It says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. This is, again, another passage where we are confronted with a statement taken from Psalm 110, that the Messiah will rule until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And you'll notice that in this passage, the Apostle Paul identifies Christ as the first fruits of the resurrection, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Which is to say that just as Jesus bodily rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, so when Jesus returns for a second time, will all his followers be raised up with new bodies as well. And it's at that point when the end will come. The reign of Jesus of Nazareth will reach its terminal point at his return, which therefore means that right now, at the present moment, King Jesus is in the process of destroying and subduing every rule and every authority and every power. And when he returns, then and only then will death be destroyed. And at that point, he will deliver the kingdom into the hands of God the Father. But in the meantime, he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. You know, sometimes people wonder, is Jesus reigning now or will he reign later? But really, that question is setting up a false dichotomy. Because the truth is, Jesus is king right now, and he is the coming king. He entered into his reign during his first coming, and he will bring his reign to its ultimate completion when he comes again, at which point death will be destroyed once and for all. You can find passages of scripture that would support both of those claims. We've already looked at a couple that identifies him as the king who now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, ruling and reigning. And so with all of that in mind, in light of all that we've considered this morning, church, may we be reminded that we serve a mighty Savior, that we worship a broad-shouldered Christ, that we are subjects of a King whose authority is like no other, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth because not only is he David's son, he is David's Lord. He is the Son of God who took it upon himself to bear the robe of our humanity so that he might become David's son. And in so doing, two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, were joined together in the single person of Jesus Christ which qualified him to be the perfect mediator that we so desperately need. He lived the perfect life. He died on the cross to bear the penalty of our sins. He conquered the grave. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And there before God the Father Almighty, he was crowned with dignity, honor, and glory. And now he forever lives as the majestic king of glory, who must rule and who will rule until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The state of his humiliation is behind him, and his exalted position of authority is ever before him. And given that that is the case, which it is, there is only one proper response that we can give him. Bow. Bow before him. Bow in humility, 
bow in reverence, but bow. He is the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords who rightfully deserves all praise, all glory, all honor, all worship, all devotion, all adoration. He deserves it all because he is Lord over all. So may we humbly prostrate ourselves before him and give him the glory that is due his holy name. Let's pray together. Father, we confess that your son is not only David's descendant, but he is David's Lord. And by extension, we acknowledge him as our Lord and only Savior. God, we give him all the glory because he rightfully deserves it. He willingly and voluntarily came to this earth to live the perfect life that we have failed to live to go to the cross to bear the wrath of God that we could never satisfy. Thank you for the finished work of Christ, for we know that in it we find salvation, redemption, forgiveness, and freedom. God, as we leave this place, may you help us to adore the person of Jesus Christ for all that he is and all that he's done. He is the King, and we adore him and give him all the honor and praise that he is so deserving of. Thank you for the grace and the mercy that you have shown us. Thank you for being so kind and compassionate. That despite the fact that we have a sinned against you, you have sent us a living Savior, whoever lives to make intercession on behalf of his people, and will one day return in glory and splendor, whereby every knee will be brought to their knees to confess him as Lord. Help us to do that every day and every second of our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.